all have their specific value. I have chosen Balthazar, though, because he incorporates many of the teachings that precede him, but also he pushes the envelope at times in order to come to a greater understanding not only of God himself, but also ourselves and all of creation. Now, the prototypical way of talking about the Trinity is by talking about love. Balthazar agrees, but employs some vocabulary to help us to understand what he means by love in our own lives, and more so in the life of God himself. But before we get to the vocabulary and the specifics of his Trinitarian teaching, let's first look at how Balthazar believes we have knowledge of the Trinity at all. This is a quote, a solid Trinitarian doctrine must, consequently, first of all, win access for itself from Jesus to the personal Trinity. For Balthazar, this means in concrete terms to take the path which leads from Jesus, the man Jesus, to the Father, and thus to the Son, and from Jesus to the Spirit. God is revealed, to put it simply, precisely in Christ's humanity, not behind it or in spite of it. What this means for Balthazar is that our knowledge of the Trinity comes via the revelation of Jesus Christ, the incarnate Christ. First, what we learn from the incarnate Jesus Christ is that God is referred to as Father. I have come to do the Father's will. But this then leads to our understanding of who the Son is. This was the whole discussion surrounding the Arian heresy. And once we establish that the Son is equal to the Father in nature, consubstantial, otherwise salvation is impossible, we turn to the Holy Spirit. Here too, the same reasoning is employed. If the Son must be equal to the Father in order to unite us to Him, then the Holy Spirit must be equal to the Son if He is to unite us to Christ in the Church, the sacraments, etc. Thus, our entire knowledge of the Trinitarian God comes to us via the incarnate Word of God. This is why the Jewish religion doesn't believe God is Trinity, precisely because they reject the co-equality of Jesus with the Father. The beginning for Balthazar is key here. Because God has become man, we now have access to God in and through the humanity of Jesus Christ. This will come to play a huge role for Balthazar as we move forward. Let us begin then with the traditional way of understanding the three persons in one nature. We generally say God is three in one because God is love. But this, in some sense, begs the question, why do we say that God is love? Why not just say that God loves? Balthazar turns to the actions, the missions, and then the mission of Christ to establish why we say that God is love. Why does Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, come at all? To save us, yes, but there is a great deal more to this answer, as Balthazar will point out. If Jesus is God, then he is perfect. And as perfect, he has no potential, no need for anything, no lack in himself that, that he needs to find somewhere outside of himself. If this is the case, then his taking on humanity has nothing to do with need on his part. Rather, he does it entirely for us for our salvation and perfection. It is completely other-oriented. And this is what Balthazar means by kenosis. Christ empties himself for our sake. He becomes man as a pure gift to man. He is only concerned with our well-being. In the end, Jesus Christ lays down his life, not for any gain on his part, but for the sake of his creatures, man. What does the whole mission of Jesus describe? It's an act of love. As our experience tells us, the lover's primary concern is with the beloved. And based upon what the church has learned in dealing with the heresies, Balthazar is able to draw some significant conclusions from Christ's mission of love. 
recall from Nestorianism, a nature is what allows for certain actions to be committed. A desk can be sat in, a pen can write. But with rational creatures, it is a person who is doing the acting. Let me emphasize what I mean here. When a desk enables someone to sit in it, the action tells us something about what a desk is. The same with the action of the pen writing. But the actions of a person not only tell us about what he can do, but also about who he or she is. To turn to my classic example, if I walk in the classroom, throw my books around, huff and puff, and speak sternly, what is revealed here? Is it simply revealed that these, huffing and puffing, speaking sternly, etc., are powers that humans have by their nature? No, you gather more in and through my actions. You judge that I am upset about something, I'm mad, etc. See, my actions tell you about me specifically, and not just what it means to be human, generally. In the case of Christ, then, it is not his humanity that acts, but his person who possesses his humanity. And as already established, he is a divine person, and thus his actions, performed in and through his humanity, reveal more than just what humans can do, but more deeply who Jesus is as a person. His actions as a human tell us something about his divine person. And if all of Jesus' actions in the Incarnation are canonic, emptying, self-emptying in character, truly loving, this tells us that his person is a lover. Thus, Balthazar draws an analogy between what Christ does in the Incarnation and who he is as God himself, because in both cases, the doing and the who, we are dealing with the same person. And what we have already learned about love, love is triadic. Love requires three things. You have the lover, you have the beloved, and you have the love between the two. This is a gift-giving process. The lover gives himself to the beloved. The beloved returns herself in kind. The unity between the two is the love itself. Perhaps an example for the third, the unity, will help with our understanding of this. We have already talked in class about the effects of divorce, how it affects the child most of all. But if the child does not lose their mother, nor do they lose their father, what devastates the child so? It is quite obvious, and here the child does not have a profound book knowledge of what love is, nor Trinitarian doctrine, but the child is devastated because the unity between the mom and dad is gone. The child implicitly recognizes not only lover and beloved in the relationship between mom and dad, but also the third element, love itself. Now this is a negative way of revealing what in some sense we already know about loving relationships, that there is not simply just two to tango, but there's a third part, right? that is the dance itself, love. Balthazar observes that what we know about love, and also coupled with the actions of the incarnate Jesus Christ, and sees that love's source is within God's own life. He brings the two together. In a nutshell, if God the Father is love, then his love would be concerned with an other, the beloved, and this is Jesus. As lover, the Father gives everything that he is to the beloved, his son Jesus. The Son receives all that the Father gives, welcomes the totality of the Father into his person. This is why he is consubstantial with the Father, because all that the Father is, is given to Jesus fully, and returns in love all that he is to the Father. What this means is that the Father remains the Father, and the Son remains the Son, even though they give themselves away and receive each other. The Father's gift of himself is what makes the Father the Father, 
and the Son's reception of the Father and his reciprocal gift of himself to the Father is what makes the Son the Son. The Church expresses this very point when she uses the terms unbegotten for the Father and begotten for the Son. Both the Father and Son are God, but the Father is not the Son and the Son is not the Father. There is then an infinite difference between who the Father is and who the Son is. Not a difference in what they are, but in who they are. The, stun, the Son stands as the infinitely different person to the Father, but this difference is always already simultaneously a unity because each person gifts their entire person to each other. The two persons are one without mixing the two, which would then deny the difference after the unity. We saw this problem analogously already in the Church's condemnation of monophysitism. Perhaps an example would help drive home my point. Because my wife is not me, although we are both human, she stands as an other to me. This otherness guarantees our bond because what I give away, I give to her. If I were giving myself away to myself, I would be giving nothing away. So, so our bond is because what I give away to her makes me present to her and vice versa. Or perhaps more simply stated, the fact that puzzle pieces are different is what makes them able to come together to form more than what they were on their own. Remember though, that this is an analogy. Because God is perfect love, the difference is their unity and their unity is their difference. They are not first like separate puzzle pieces that come together and become more than what they began as individually. God is love, which once again means that the Father is only the Father because of the Son, and the Son is only the Son because of the Father and their gifts to each other. But there is more. In describing love earlier, I noted the triadic character of love, the three-pronged nature of love. You find the perfection of the third of love in God, the Holy Spirit. The bond of the Father, the bond of Father and, and of Son, is so perfect and beautiful that this love between the two is a person. The Holy Spirit, as the unity of love between Father and Son, is always already giving up himself for the Father and the Son. He communicates the perfect love of the Father to the Son and vice versa. And because of this, he is equal to the love communicated. He is the very fruit of the love between father and son, and forever the bond that makes the love perfectly real. Once again, as the love between the two, the Holy Spirit is not identical in person with the lover or beloved. But here as well, the infinite difference of the Holy Spirit from father and son is what makes the unity of all three possible. The love, the Holy Spirit, is only the Holy Spirit because there is the Lover, the Father, and the Beloved, the Son. There is nothing behind these relations. God, the nature of God, is purely personal, always relational, Father, Son, and Spirit. This understanding of God as love leads Balthazar to emphasize again that the actions then of the persons in the Trinity reveal to us something about who God is. This is what he means by speaking of the economic Trinity, the actions of God in creation revealing the imminent Trinity, who God is in himself. Knowing this alleviates the problems that the early heretics face because it provides us with a foundation to interpret passages within scripture church tradition, etc. Recall, Arius thinks Jesus, the Son, is lesser than the Father because he only does the will of the Father. But interpreted through the principle of God is love, there is no need to diminish the Son to a lesser God. In love, one turns their will over to the other for the sake of the other. Thus, Jesus is not lesser than the Father, but actually is revealing what love is. Who God is. is novel in applying this interpretive key to the cross. Balthazar claims that the cross is the deepest revelation of who God is. 
This seems absurd at first, because the cross is a horrific method of torture and death. How can such an act of evil be a revelation of God? Balthazar calls our attention to why Christ allows himself to be crucified. It is for our sake. He who knew no sin takes on sin for the sake of sinners. Christ is following the will of the Father, that all men be saved, and giving his entire life for his creation. This is the foundation of love. Christ, as a man and for man's sake, gives all of himself to the Father in love, and the Father returns his love to the Son, which is the unitive factor. But because Christ is also man, humanity has been taken up into this unity between Father and Son. Man has been incorporated into the love of the Trinity, and this, exact, this is exactly what man was made for from the beginning.